today I get to continue in the subject series called The Power to Change. The question is this, can people change? Can people change? I mean really change. Yes, they can. But many people never do. We started off this series talking about supernatural change. That we need the Spirit of God to change. It's, it's got to start on the inside of us. And then last weekend, we had our young communicators, Dallas and Jackson. Jackson, tear it up on change through renewing of the mind. One of my favorite weekends of the year where we get to see young communicators open the Word of God. Today, I get to continue on the subject. Our theme verse is out of Romans chapter 12 where it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. So there's this urging. There's this pleading in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the world, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And one more scripture today where I left off two weeks ago is out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And I highlighted Lord because today as I talk about transformation and the power to change, here is my subject that I've, I really feel strongly from the, strongly from the Lord to, to talk on today was the Lord of change. The Lord of change. Go ahead and high five three people and then you may be seated. <clears throat> The Lord of change. Let's talk about it. So what is change, church? What is it? Is it having a notebook full of sermon notes? That's a good idea. Is it getting a brand new nose or a tummy tuck? <laughs> People are changing the way they look all the time. But is that the essence of change? You know, at our wedding, when my wife and I got married 30 years ago, one of my groomsmen stood up in the garter toss time. So he was getting everybody ready and got the garter and was ready to, you know how they do in weddings afterwards, where he gathered, he said, hey, all the single people, why don't you gather over here who want to be married? And then anybody who's married that wants to be married to somebody else, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> so come on over here and they toss the garter, right? And then they're fighting for that because, man, I want to change in my life. And, 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 you know, some things are supposed to change and some things are not, right? And I thought about that. You want to be married to somebody else. And we want change. And sometimes we think the change is going to happen because stuff on the outside changes. Like I'm going to change that job. I'm going to change where I live. I'm going to change that city. I'm going to change that relationship. I'm going to, all these outward things when really what God is after is you. God is after me. He's after a change on the inside of us. And every one of us have come to places in our life, if we're honest, where we've known we had to change. We wake up in the morning with another excruciating headache after yet another failed attempt to stay sober. And we're, we're just frustrated that we haven't changed yet. We find ourselves driving in the car in the middle of the night for hours because we... Just we're going nowhere, but because we got another explosive argument with our spouse. Or maybe the pattern is different for you, but it's the same scenario and you're sick of it and you know that you need to change. Maybe three times this last week, you found out yourself lying. Like I lied to my boss, I lied to my kids, and then I lied to myself that it wasn't really a lie anyway when you know that it was. And you just can't stand it anymore. Every one of us has had places and seasons in our life where we know, I gotta change. Something's gotta give and I'm, I'm tired of staying the same. I need you to know, thank God, we can change. We don't have to stay the same. And change is God's gift to us. So I want to talk about that today. I'm going to give you three preliminary thoughts about change. And I have one main thought that I want you to grab today. 
And I believe will be the essence of God beginning to bring the change process in our life. First thought is this that I want us to grab. Is that change is an essential part of being a Christian. Bottom line is Romans commanded us to be transformed. Romans said, hey, in light of God's mercy, present your bodies like this and be transformed. Not if you think like maybe that would be a good idea right now. I'm in a good mood. I should probably work on some stuff. No, just com Romans commanded us to be transformed, to change. Corinthians just tells us that you are being transformed. So the essence of Romans chapter 12 where we started, I need you to know this about the book of Romans. Up until Romans 12, he's laying this foundation. Y'all messed up. That's pretty much what he's saying. He's going, listen, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. So go ahead and tell your neighbor, you're messed up too. Go ahead and just tell him right now. I'm not the only one. <clears throat> I ain't the only one that needs to change. You need to change. Now, if you're married, that might've started something right there. I don't know. <laughs> Romans 12 is just basically telling us we are all sinners in, in need of a complete overhaul from the inside out. We need new hearts and we need God's spirit in order to bring about the change. And if we refuse to humble ourselves and admit our need for a new you, then there's no hope for a true change. So we need to know this. Change is an essential part of being a, ch a, a Christian, being a Christ follower. The day we stop changing is the day we begin to die. You know, there's a king in the Old Testament by the name of David, and David was a great warrior, and God's presence and his, his glory rested on him, and one day he just decided, I've been to a lot of battles, I've been in a lot of fights, and I've seen God do a lot of stuff, but you know what? I deserve a break today. And he decided to stay home, and he stayed home, and he got in a lot of trouble, he stayed home and he saw some stuff he shouldn't have seen. He saw a woman that he shouldn't have seen. He got, he got attracted to somebody other than his own wife and got in a lot of trouble. And that was the day that his kingdom began to die. Every time that we begin to stop the process of change, we begin to step out of the process of being a follower of Jesus. I just need you to know, Jesus is all about making us like him. Everything that is growing is changing. When children grow, they have to change their shoe sizes. They have to change their clothes sizes. As they grow, they have to change the books they read. They have to change the grades that they attend. They have to change the schools that they go to. As they grow, things change. And you need to know this, if you're going to grow in your walk with God, things are going to change. But you notice this as you follow Jesus, that not everyone around you will want the change that you want. You will notice that you'll be changing and you'll, you'll realize, man, not everybody is into this whole change thing. In fact, if you go back to your 10-year reunion or your 20-year reunion, you realize a lot of these people didn't change at all. They look a little different or a lot different, but they're the same old them. You need to know this. If you're going to follow Jesus, Jesus is all about bringing change in your life. I'm going to give you three Ps, by the way. It's a part that's my first P. It's a part of being a Christian. I also need to encourage you today, it's possible. Change is possible because God never changes. Look at this out of Malachi 3. For I am the Lord, I do not change. And this is encouraging to me because God's not wishy-washy. He is true north. And so we always have something that we are changing towards. And the day I stop, if, if you feel like, man, I don't need to change anymore. It's like me and Jesus, we're the same. Listen, that ain't happening in this life. Okay? Now, there is, there, if, if you play instruments, you know this about guitars. You know that they always need to be retuned. If you let a guitar sit, it'll need to be tuned again. If you play it, it'll need to be tuned again. If, 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 if it, it just has, it, it, in the elements, it needs to be tuned again. In fact, we've had pianos in our home for decades. And we learned this, when you have a piano, they tell you do not put a piano next to a wall that is, an, is next to the outdoors. Because you don't want the temperature fluctuation from the wall to affect the tuning of the piano. So you need the piano next to an inside wall, not an outside wall. Every instrument gets out of tune. You need to know this about yourself. We can get in tune and we can get out of tune. And they used to have things like this and they still use them every now and then, tuning forks. 
tuning forks. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this over the microphone or not, but this is a, they would use tuning forks back in the day to be able to tune a piano to its perfect pitch, to, its, to exactly what it's supposed to be. Let's see if you can hear this. I don't know if you'll be able to. Oh, you can, can't you? Oh, it hurts, doesn't it? All right. Here's something cool that you might not have known about tuning forks. If you have one tuning fork resonating and you put another tuning fork close enough and it's not resonating at all, hasn't even been struck, but if you strike one and this one's not on at all, but you touch it, if it gets close enough, the other tuning fork will resonate at the exact same frequency. I tell you that because of this. The Spirit of God never needs to be retuned. The Spirit of God is always exactly, God does not change. He's always pure C. He's always what true north is. And his spirit now dwells in our spirit. And every time we need retuned, all we need to do is just allow the spirit of God to speak to our spirit. If they get close enough, it'll cause where we're out of tune to get in tune. Change is possible. Go ahead and tell your neighbor, change is possible. All right, it is possible. I don't care how much the devil has lied to you that you'll never change. Let the gospel be, penetrate every stronghold and lie of the enemy Amen. that you'll never change. No, 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 change is possible because God never changes. Now let me ask the question, what is change? What is change? It's not just hearing something. It's not just taking notes on something. It's not just learning something. It's not even enjoying something or appreciating something or even being a part of something. Change isn't real change until change bears fruit. And here's the other P I wanna give you before the meat of what I wanna share with you today. So change is a part of being a Christian. Change is possible because, you're, because our God never changes. And then I need you to know this, that change is a process and not an event. Now this is encouraging and frustrating simultaneously. <laughs> it's encouraging when I'm not perfect yet because I go, oh, I'm in a process, right? I'm in a process. But it's also discouraging because I'm in a process. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Romans said this, that you'll be able to discern what the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God is. Corinthians were transformed from glory to glory. It talks about a process. It's saying that we're being transformed. So it, there, there's, you've probably heard of some of these sculptors that, that, that have this process on this big old chunk of stone. 1464, this guy, I can't even pronounce his name, but I'll try. August, Augustino de Ducio. I have probably just ruined it. I don't know. In Florence, they wanted this statue of an Old Testament figure, prophet in the Old Testament. And so they gave him this big old uh, marred piece of marble and stone. And he said, work on it. And he did for a couple of years until he was just stymied by it because it has this marred area and I don't know what to do with it. And so it laid rest for a decade until this guy came along, Antonio, and in 1476, and he worked on it for a while. And then he was stymied. And then, it, and then you've heard of this guy by the name of Michelangelo who came, 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 he was 26 years old, came along a couple of decades later, saw the same marred piece of marble and looked at it where other uh, architects and designers were all stymied and stumped. And even it said that Leonardo da Vinci couldn't even figure out what to do with it. But Michelangelo looked at it and goes, oh, no, 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 I'm gonna have, I'm gonna work on this, and he did. In that marred area, he ended up making a tree stump and he created the great statue, the 17 foot, st 17 foot tall statue of David that is one of the greatest, greatest pieces of art ever, and, and there's really no more statue like it. How did he, when others couldn't do it, couldn't make something great out of something marred, how did he do it? Here's his answer in his own words. He said, in every block of marble, I see a statue as plain as though it stood before me, shaped and perfect in attitude and action. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the lovely apparition to reveal it to the other eyes 
as mine see it. In maybe more colloquial terms, I cut away everything that didn't look like David. Is that not what Jesus is doing in our lives? I am chopping away at everything that doesn't look like Jesus. Here's what I get from that. All of us are works in progress. You're a work in progress. I think we should all walk around with shirts that say under construction. <laughs> right? So whenever we find ourselves manifesting in ways, ways that are more like our old man than our new man, we just, hey, look at the shirt. I'm under construction. Jesus is chipping away at everything that doesn't look like him, but I'm grateful for this truth. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to finish that, what, that which he starts. I want you to watch this couple minute testimony of the power of change of somebody in our church. Well, my name is Judd and this is my wife, Jackie. When I first came through the doors of Life Church, I was addicted to heavy drugs, prescription drugs and street drugs. And um, Jackie was in the process of going through the proper paperwork to find out a way to get away from me. It had been about seven years of just praying over the situation, not knowing exactly what was going on, but knowing that something wasn't right. But in the past three and a half years, I've been able to find the right people. I've been able to find the right groups, the right community. I've been able to trust people for the right reasons and get plugged in. Right about the point where I was ready to just be done with it, on my way to see an attorney and start talking divorce, that he was also at the same time ready to be done with drugs and alcohol. Since we started coming to Life Church, I've got to see what it takes to be a real man, what it takes to be a real father, what it takes to be a real husband, and to learn those tools, to go through impact, to go through freedom, to, to go through small groups. It's amazing to really get to know the real me. Life looks completely different now. I got plugged in on a dream team. I started serving, ended up doing impact, and now we're in Pendleton serving on the Connections team and water baptisms. And God's restoration is greater than anything you can even imagine. It has been a journey. I will tell you the seven years that I prayed, I never ever would have imagined that this would be my life now. It can be nothing else but Him. I know that God's going to do something big through this and marriages are going to be restored. Addicts are going to get set free. There's going to be so many more stories just like this. Change is possible. You believe it? Yes. Jesus changes lives. All right. I, I, I want to I go back to one of our theme verses out of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed. So we're in this process. You are being changed. You are becoming more like Jesus into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. By the Spirit of what? Of who? Spirit of what? The Lord. Of the Lord. And this just jumped off the pages of Scripture to me. I felt like God's wanted me to declare this truth. It is a, I know it's not really a one point message because I gave you three Ps, but this is my one point today. And this is if you only remember one thing that I have to say today, what I think the scriptures have to teach us today, I want it to be this next thought. If you want change in your life, the level of change in your life is directly related to the level of lordship in your life. The level of change in your life is directly related to the level of lordship in your life. You want change, but you want to stay in charge. It doesn't work that way. Why do some people change and others do not? Some people just become older versions of who they already are. And the Bible teaches us why some people don't change. The Bible actually teaches us why people, ch why some do and why some do not. And it is the level of change in their life is directly related to the level of lordship in their life. Check this out out of Psalm chapter 55. Because they do not change, therefore they do not fear God. People who don't fear God are those 
who want Jesus as Savior but push back from the table at his lordship. Like I want to come to the buffet of Christianity and I want God to bless my life. I want him to be my savior. I don't want to go to hell. I mean, who wants to go there? But when you start talking about lordship, excuse me. When you have a fear of God and Jesus is your Lord, hear this. When he tells you to do something, you do it. When he says, ask for forgiveness first. You ask for forgiveness first. How does a marriage change? Because Jesus is Lord of somebody in that marriage. Period. I know it's not rocket science. It's so simple. But if you want your relationships to change, if you want your finances to change, Jesus needs to be Lord of that area. I heard a story, true story, and this pastor wanted a cookie out of one of those, you know, coin-operated dispensing machines that has all the letters and the numbers, and you have to, you know, A15, you press A, and then you press, you know, 15, and then it's got those, those coils, you know what I'm talking about? Those coils that kind of start to move, and then, oh, out drops the cookie or whatever item that you want. So he put in his coins, and he pushed a 15, and the coil started to turn, and it was like, oh, eat, just a little bit, and then they didn't turn, and didn't, didn't release his cookie, and you know, of course, what you do at that point is you shake the machine, <laughs> you cast the devils out of the machine, <laughs> you're like, I want my cookie, right, and so he did all of that, and he's like, the thing ain't moving, the cookie stuck, the machine, no matter how much you shake it, so what do you do, he started to hit the, the change button, and he's like, I, I, I want, I want my change back, I, and the change didn't come back. He got frustrated, turned around, and heard the Spirit of God say to him as he was leaving, I want you to turn back around. I want you to see something, and I want to teach you something. So he turned back around at that same machine that he had just been frustrated with, that he tried to get his change back from, that wouldn't give him his cookie, and he saw a sign that said, out of order. <laughs> and he thought, how did I not see the out of order sign? But he heard the Spirit of God say to him this, don't invest in something that's out of order and expect change. Don't invest in something that's out of order and expect change. Here's my question for you. Is your life in order? Who's in charge? Are you or is God? Because if your life is out of order, don't expect change. If your life is in order, then the spirit of the Lord is in charge of your life. You are submitting to his lordship when he tells you to do something uncomfortable like confess your sin to your brother. <laughs> Not going to happen. You know, or tithe, or serve, or be generous, or ask for forgiveness. And whenever he tells you something, he's Lord. Your life is not out of order. So you do what he tells you to do. That's where change comes. That's it. That was my message. I said everything preliminary just to say that point. Because somebody's life is out of order. And I know y'all look here, you're like, I come every Sunday. Yeah, but wait, there's some area. Some area. If, if change has not happened in your life in a long time, something's out of order. If change hasn't been transpiring in your life, somewhere along the line, you ignored a prompting of the Holy Spirit and God hasn't forgotten about it even though you have. Mm -hmm. I know you're glad you came to church today. <laughs> Comfort and ease never produces change in your life. When did we start to believe that God would never ask me to serve, to give, to submit, to love? When did I ever think 
that I would, God would never ask me to do something that would be uncomfortable. When he's Lord, he absolutely does. Now, the author of Romans and Corinthians, of which are our theme verses for this series, The Power of Change. His name is Paul. He was Saul. He's the one who said, be transformed. He's the one who said, you are being transformed. He's the one who tells us about change. I need you to know this about the author of these scriptures. The one that God used. He was a persecutor of you and I. He was a persecutor of Christians. He was so much so that he was having them killed and martyred for the faith. And he enjoyed his job. It was a good job. He liked it. Until God got a hold of him. And when God got a hold of him, I want you to see the moment God got a hold of this man by the name of Saul, who his, then became known as Paul. Look at this. Out of Acts chapter 9. This was his first question. Who are you, Lord? His first question was, who are you? But he had some realization, you're God. You're, you're not just my Savior. You're Lord, Saul asked. And this is what Jesus said. I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting, which by the way, I find very interesting. This is its own thought, free today, not a part of the sermon notes. <laughs> Paul was persecuting the church, and Jesus said, I'm Jesus, and I'm the one you're persecuting. Jesus is so tight with you that it's one and the same to him. He's like, if you touch them, you're actually touching me. That's kind of cool. He replied, now get up. This is his first conversation with Jesus. Jesus says, get up. And go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now that's a salvation call. That's like, I'm Lord, get your butt up and I'm going to tell you where to go and I'm going to be, I'm going to be telling you what you have to do. Yes, sir. <laughs> and that's the man who writes, be changed. And you're going to be changed by the spirit of the Lord. Okay? That's, he says that in Corinthians. This is how he's born again right here in Acts chapter 9. And then when he writes Romans, he makes the case for chapters that we're all sinners. But then he talks about his own frustration and of his own, you know, uh, quandary between his natural man and spiritual man. And look at how he says change happens in Romans 7. What a wretched man I am. There's some humility and some honesty, and that's where change starts. You got to be humble and realize you ain't all that, right? None of us are. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Here's his response. Thanks be to God who delivers me. He's the one who changes me. How? Not just through Jesus, but through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If you're going to be delivered... If you're going to tap into the power of change, it's going to be through this humble recognition you need it and this humble submission to Jesus' Lord, Lordship. If one day you're killing Christians and the next day you are loving Christians, I'd say that's change. <laughs> and God changes people when Jesus becomes Lord of their life. Now, if you stop changing in a while, again, somewhere along the line, you might have switched seats with Jesus. He's in the driver's seat. You're the passenger. He's telling us what we must do. And ever somewhere along the ride, you might have said, hey, I'll drive. You tired? How about you sit in the passenger seat and start blessing me? Because I have a dream that I want to get fulfilled and I need your favor to do it. I got two applications. Come up, whoever's playing. The two of you. The two of you. You can't see this in Pendleton, but she's pregnant. That's why I was saying the two of you. I got two thoughts for us. Let this be your, our application today. And the first thought is this. Give God and yourself time. Because it's a process. Since change is a lifelong process rather than an event, it is imperative that we give God and ourselves time. There's an interesting dynamic and tension that I want you to embrace. You need to know this truth dwells in tension. Truth dwells in tension. And I need you to understand a, a tension truth here. You cannot change what you are not willing to confront. This is one side of the tension. 
You cannot change what you are not willing to admit. You need to say, I have some anger issues. How about we say it more biblical? I have a sin of anger. We just call them issues and problems today when the Bible calls them sin. I have a sin of lust or a sin of pride or a sin of whatever it might be. Call it out. But that's one side and I want to bring in the tension. Because change is a process, you have to admit your weakness, but once you humble yourself and you admit the sin issue in your heart and in your life and you admit it to God, I need you to switch your focus from your weakness to his lordship and God's grace. I need you to, I need you to, we start here, oh God, what a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I admit to you and I confess my sin to you. And then I swing over and I say, oh, thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ, I give you praise because you conquered sin and the grave. You are mightier than every issue that has tried to trip me up my entire life, my parents, my grandparents. I don't care how long it's in my family line. Today, I say, Jesus, break the curse that has been over my family. I admit it to you, but now I focus on you. Here's what I want to tell you this. Listen, if you focus on your faults too long, your confidence to change will decrease. So if you will get to a place where you will humble yourself, then here's what the devil does. He tries to keep you there and push you in it. And he goes, that's right. And he tries to identify you by it and say, yes, you are that. You are prideful. Yes, you are angry. And that's who you are. And that's who you'll always be. But if you focus on your faults too long, your confidence will decrease. But if you'll switch and you'll focus on his faithfulness, your confidence will increase. So here's the deal. Change in your life will happen because we humble ourselves under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then we focus on that lordship. And we say, you're not just Lord of me. You are Lord of heaven, earth, hell, the grave. You are king. You are God Almighty. Nothing is too strong for you. If you can change a Saul of Tarsus from a religious man that killed Christians and turned him into somebody who gave his entire life for the furtherance of the church of which he tried to destroy and died a martyr's death. If you can change him, you can change me, oh God. But to God be all the glory. I focus on his faithfulness. So I start here. I give God and myself time. And I just simply submit to his lordship. And I want you to meditate on his great power. Hear me. You've got to start using the scriptures like they're meant to be used. They're powerful. And God has an answer in the Bible for every sin issue. And you begin to look at what the Bible says and who God is and his authority and his dominion. And you begin to declare that over your life. And you go, I don't feel like it. That's okay. You're going to be delivered by faith, not by your feelings. Your feelings is what got you in trouble in the first place. Your feelings aren't going to get you out of trouble. Your faith is going to get you out of trouble. And so you meditate on his great power, his lordship over messed up things in your life. He's big enough to straighten out the worst situations in you and around you. And so I simply want you to ask God what he would like from you today. That's it. That's the end of my message. Let's bow our heads. I want to ask the question. Pendleton, 
I want you to be quiet. I don't want anybody moving around. Walla Walla, online, don't, don't be distracted because this is the crux of the message. God, what would you like from me today? What is it that I have been ignoring? What do you want from me? Just listen for a few moments. Just listen. The Spirit of the living God, the Spirit of the Lord, rests down upon Life Church and everyone who calls this place home. In the sound of my voice, either now or on demand later, Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, rest in this place. Rest upon the message. Rest upon the hearts and the minds of people. And speak. And may we hear you. We submit to your Lordship. You are King. You are Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed for another moment, I know God is speaking to some people and he's reminding you of something. He's, he's talking about your maybe a daily time with him. He's saying, I want you to meet with me. I want you to read the Bible more regularly. I want you to release that offense. I don't know what it is, but I know that he's talking to people. But with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's someone that has never submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. You've never actually asked him to be your Savior and your Lord. You don't know what it means to be what the Bible says is born again. And this is your opportunity. You're one prayer away from changing your eternal address from hell to heaven. And this is the most important prayer that you would ever pray in your life. If that would be you and you would say, Bob, I want to pray that prayer. I want to get my life right with God. I know I'm not right with him today. I want to get my life right with Jesus. I'm going to pray one more prayer. And I want to know who wants to pray that prayer with me that would say, I want to submit my life to his lordship and I want to be sure that he is my savior and my Lord. On the count of three, I just want you to look up, wave your hand at me or your campus director there in Pendleton. On the count of three, I want you to let me know, Bob, I'm gonna pray that prayer with you. One, two, three. Will you just look up at me right now so we can catch eyes and wave at me? Thank you, thank you. Today's your day, today is your day. Who else is here today? I don't wanna miss you today. Awesome, awesome, thank you. Thank you. He loves you, he loves you. Church, you know what to do. Let, we're gonna pray with our friends together. Come on, can we stand up together right now? And repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today in need of forgiveness. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. I want to be born again. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. All the days of my life. I pray this now in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted amen. Can we give him praise for how good he is? Hallelujah. We hope that today's message encouraged you. At Life Church, we believe that wherever you are in your relationship with God, there's always a next step to take, and we're here to help you find yours. If you made the decision to follow Jesus today, or you're simply looking to get more involved in this community, we invite you to check out our Next Steps page. You'll find all the information you need by clicking the link in the description below. If this message impacted you in any way, we encourage you to do two things. First, share this video with a friend. It's a wonderful way to share the love of Jesus with someone you care about. Second, we'd love to hear your story. Click the link in the description to share your testimony with us so we can celebrate all God is doing in your life. We're excited to be on this journey of following Jesus with you and hope you have a great week.